Welcome to uh, World SME Day. I'm Angie Lau, CEO, founder, and editor-in-chief of Forecast News. It is my great pleasure to lead this next discussion here as we explore really the enterprise use cases of blockchain and how to make it work for one of the most important sectors uh, in our global economy, and that's SMEs. Um, the question that we often ask ourselves, no doubt, as enterprise uh, owners and leaders is, why engage in blockchain? Why engage in this new emerging technology? What do I need to think about as I address or consider even adopting blockchain ahead of doing so? How can one learn about real world solutions and blockchain use cases for SMEs? Uh, and what are the challenges and opportunities for SMEs in 2021 and beyond? There's no doubt all of these questions will be addressed very succinctly with our very esteemed panel of guests. And uh, without further ado, we're very honored to have top experts from Consensus, from R3, from Ant Group, and from BSN to help really steer us into looking at how blockchain enterprise use cases can be highly opportunistic and also uh, really, really exponential for SMEs. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our panelists. Amit Ghosh, head of APAC R3, Amit, hello. We also have Charles Dosi, head of Consensus uh, Asia Pacific. Jet Jiang, Chief of Staff, Head of Business Intelligence at Ant Group. And Tim Bailey joins us. He's VP of Global Sales of Red Date, also uh, leading, uh, that is the group that is leading uh, BSN Development Association. So let us dive in here. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. I think for our audience, it would be great to hear from each of you what you're separately doing in this space and how you view it. So Charles Dosi of Consensus, I'll start with you. Thank you so much, uh, Angie. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us today. So my name is uh, Charles Dosi. I'm the managing director of Consensus for Asia Pacific. Uh, Consensus is one of the largest uh, blockchain engineering company. Uh, we focus on uh, building enterprise software uh, and uh, consumer software uh, for the, what we call the Web 3.0. Uh, so you might be familiar with, uh, with software like Metamask, or some other initiative we have with central banks where we help, uh, for example, the HKMA uh, to, uh, to bring the Hong Kong dollar and some other currencies uh, on the blockchain. Um, so we have a, a strong history of, uh, of engineering for the world of enterprise and a full stack of software to really, really help with that. And reinventing the business for SMEs, uh, looking at how they can collaborate more, more deeply. So I really look forward to the conversation today. Charles, thank you. Amit Ghosh of R3. Uh, Angie, thanks. And uh, it's great to be here uh, this morning with uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, so a uh, quickly, a quick introduction of uh, who R3 is. We are an enterprise software company, primarily pro uh, providing software to enable trust and transparency. Uh, and you know, blockchain is one of the fundamental software technologies to enable that trust. Uh, in addition, we do a lot of work um, on the confidential computing space to enable trust uh, when data exchanges are happening. Uh, we are a six-year-old company, 15 offices globally, uh, Singapore headquartered for the Asia Pacific region. So look, uh, really looking forward to dive deeper into uh, the benefits our technology and the use cases are providing to SMEs. Thank you so much, Amit. Jet, uh, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Jet Ziang of uh, Ant Group uh, to share what you're doing in this space. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm, my name is Jet Xiang, uh, coming from Ant Group. So uh, I'm acting as a chief of staff and also head of the business uh, intelligence group. Uh, so basically I'm focused on the marketing, um, internal operation excellence, and also some strategic planning for the, for the team. So uh, actually Ant Chain, now we call it Ant Chain, coming from Ant Blockchain, which we changed our name from uh, uh, August last year. So um, we, we're starting from experiment uh, labs coming from Ant Group, uh, focused on blockchain and focused on maybe like three years on the engineering. 
and uh, start the industry, go industry about two years ago. So now we have a lot of industry scenario and solutions uh, for uh, like public sector, like uh, banks, like uh, many others. But I still think this is very early stage uh, for the blockchain solutions uh, for the market. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jet. But at last, but definitely not least, Tim Bailey, uh, tell us what you're doing at BSN um, from Red Date's point of view. Thank you. Thanks, Angie. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Tim Bailey. I'm with Red Date Technology. Red Date is the technical architect and is responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance and operation of the BSN for the blockchain-based service network. And the BSN is a an infrastructure um, that we've created that integrates you know, dozens of permissioned and permissionless blockchain protocols and interchain services um, as a way to bring down the cost and ease of development for enterprises, uh, including SMEs. Uh, and my responsibility is to kind of lead and drive the, the business of, of the BSN outside of our markets in China. You know, those are conversations that are not only robust, but at times probably difficult as well. A lot of SMEs are probably wondering, okay, I've heard about it. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've experienced it. Perhaps I don't understand it entirely. What is blockchain? Um, you know, and certainly if you're an SME in our audience, uh, you know, you are not alone. Uh, there are a lot of SMEs still really struggling to understand how to make blockchain technology work for them to uh, understand, um, you know, how they might use it in enterprise uh, uh, cases. Uh, and, and some might still remain doubtful about this blockchain technology. So uh, in the next hour, we are going to uh, really try to answer all of that for you. So, so are you guys ready to dive in? Um, let's, let's go ahead and do that. So first, uh, this is really for the group. What is the promise of blockchain? What is enterprise blockchain, first of all, and how can it transform business? Um, and, uh, you know, Charles, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you directly, uh, consensus being obviously the, uh, the leading, uh, use for uh, Ethereum in enterprise solutions. Uh, you know, you're already doing that with, uh, you know, the acquisition of Quorum from JP Morgan, um, and you've really solidified uh, the enterprise uh, solution positioning uh, with Ethereum. What are you doing in the region? What are the, you know, especially when, when, when you, you, talk, you start having conversations with somebody and they say, well, why would I use the enterprise blockchain? Absolutely, Angie. I think uh, when, whenever there is uh, entrepreneurs from the, from the world of SMEs looking at looking at blockchain, um, there is two ways to go, a very technical way of trying to understand the technology. Uh, it's a fascinating technology, but people don't necessarily need to know all the, the gritty details of uh, distributed data and cryptography and all these things. There is a, a lot of technology today which we use uh, on a daily basis, which we don't necessarily understand. Uh, how is uh, Zoom working or how is your email uh, uh, backend is working as well is not necessarily something you want to go into too much details. So you come back to the original uh, definition of, of blockchain in the context of your business, which I think is the most meaningful definition. And blockchain is a collaboration technology. So you never build a blockchain for you only. You only look at, uh, at use cases and, and, and daily challenges in your, uh, in, your, uh, in your enterprise operations, looking at how many people you need to interact for maybe shipping a container uh, across the world, or financing an invoice, or, or moving money cross borders. So all the different operations of your company, which are involving different stakeholders and partners. And you look at your flow today and you're thinking, okay, oh my God, I'm sending an email and then we are signing a document and possibly I need to send a paper and I need to rush to the bank. Uh, and all of these flows are essentially a suboptimal. So you, you, then you look for a technology stack, which is enabling to connect all these different stakeholders and starting to put things in uh, the flows into, into business logics, which can be uh, automated later on by, uh, by a, a blockchain enterprise software. So don't get lost too much into, into the technology per se, unless you really like it, but really think of how you can get a, a new kind of infrastructure which will be shared uh, with, uh, with your partners. And that's some, sometimes a little bit of a, 
uh, a new territory to explore uh, for entrepreneurs and, um, and, and executives uh, looking at building, co-building an infrastructure with partners, rather than uh, upgrading your server or getting uh, yourself a new PC. It's really looking at the group. And I think that's where, where the conversation uh, should be starting when, when we approach SMEs and blockchain. You know, and, and it, you, you bring up a great point. It really is about the group and there is no bigger group that really is embracing blockchain uh, than the financial world. And R3, you're really leading uh, that pack um, as you are uh, providing a lot of blockchain solutions uh, in the financial services industry with your flagship Corda Enterprise. Talk to us about what SMEs are doing in the region. What are the challenges um, uh, sometimes that you need to address um, and, and how to best explain it to an SME who is thinking, okay, how, how does this actually streamline um, and make seamless uh, something that, that has been very um, you know, burdensome all, all these years? Yeah, look, I, I think the promise, and to link a little bit back to your uh, prior question as well, uh, the promise really for the SMEs uh, is really about trust, it's really about digitization actually uh, at the highest level, then trust, then transparency, uh, and really uh, reduced cost in their operations. I think that's, that's really the promise. And as Charles said, you know, I, I would agree that you know, uh, most SMEs do, probably don't have the IT teams to go into either building full-fledged solutions where they build, bring multi-parties together they're often consuming technology solutions, right? So when they're, when they're choosing an existing solution of this shelf, let's say for supply chain finance, you know, what's the benefit of a traditional technology led solution versus a blockchain led solution, right? I think that's, that's the awareness they need to have. So let me take an example of what's really happening and you know, that would illustrate the benefits which SMEs are getting uh, when, when they're interacting with blockchain led solutions built on Corda. So in Thailand, for example, uh, you know, we, we have uh, a solution built by a, a company called Digital Ventures. Uh, they, they work with Siam Cement Group, which is one of the biggest conglomerates there, really to digitize the procure to pay process for 5,000 suppliers, which uh, Siam Cement Group had. Now this, this process was already happening. It was very paper-based, occasionally digital, but not really truly digital. And then you bring a bank into the mix. What that really does, uh, and Siam Commercial Bank was the bank which came uh, and led this as well with Siam Cement Group. But what, what that ha enabled really is, you know, it digitized the entire workflow from the bank mm -hmm. to the big corporate to their large suppliers and many, many, many small suppliers and the SMEs. Uh, and essentially uh, what it allowed to do is then the bank can provide financing to these small suppliers now because they have data uh, to risk assess them. Earlier, they never had data because you know, these suppliers were just interacting with Siam Cement Group in a more manual paper-based manner, right? So now banks can provide financing. Uh, SMEs benefit not just from financing, but from a better view of the data uh, which they have with their primary buyer, which is Siam Cement Group in that case. And really, you know, uh, if you put the COVID challenge on top of all of this, like this becomes even more important, uh, I would say, in the last year and a half where supply chains have got disrupted, financing has become harder. Uh, so really, I think uh, that's really the benefit. So if, if I go back to the headline, it is digitization. It is uh, really enabling multi-party workflows. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is, it is enabling trust so that you can get the benefits like financing, like better data, and so on. You know, one of the one of the most um, uh, well quoted uh, statistics that I've often used is that um, there's a, I believe it was an 80% uh, of global firms are in some shape or form engaged in uh, digital transformation uh, in 2019. In 2020, 100%, 100%. <laughs> I, um, and in that vein, you know, Tim, that's, that's what you're doing um, uh, over at Red Date with uh, Blockchain Service Network. Uh, worrying in the background is blockchain. And so how should SMEs think about what that, that experience should feel and look like as they, they, as they try to think about it for their business? 
Well, I, I think um, back to one of the points that Charles was making earlier about you know, IT budgets and large enterprise versus SME. And I think um, we have a, a similar experience and use case that Amit has uh, in Thailand, this time in, in China with um, a company that we work with there who has built a, a corporate finance um, platform based on blockchain that allows um, large enterprises to, to um, work with banks and provide uh, have the banks provide financing to the you know literally tens of thousands of SMEs upstream in their supply chains um, who who need financing but they need a, a trusted way the banks need a trusted way to um, look at their information and do a risk assessment of them and I, so I think that a lot of the early enterprise um, blockchain projects are going to be driven by the large enterprises but the SMEs will interact with them um, as suppliers or downstream sales partners or channel partners. So I think a lot of the early interaction, again, will be uh, for SMEs um, being part of a, a large enterprises network. Um, what BSN is trying to do is, is bring down the cost of all of that. Um, you know, we have a belief that, you know, blockchain now is kind of like the internet in the mid nineties, where it was very expensive to build a website and um, create an e-commerce business. And it was only when that cost became very, very low um, that, a, you know, a university student in, in her dorm room could build an e-commerce business um, that it really took off. And so we're trying to do, do the same thing um, with the BSN is drive down the cost so that individual developers and SMEs can actually you know, build solutions um, in a cost-effective way. That, that cost-effectiveness is a great point. Um, if it's expensive, it's hard to make that decision to adopt. Bring down the cost, you get scalability for a lot of businesses and you get mass adoption. How close are we to that? All, and this is for all of you. I, I mean, I, I think um, I think for SMEs, honestly, I think we're, you know, we're still three to five years for what I would call mass adoption, right? We're, we're still kind of moving in the large enterprise space from people doing POCs to people saying, okay, look, this POC worked and I want to adopt this. So I think mass adoption is going to happen in enterprise earlier than will happen in SMEs for some of the reasons that, that I talked about earlier. I don't know, I'd be interested, Char Charles and uh, Charles and uh, Amit and Jed are kind of on the front lines of this uh, as well. So I'd be interested in their views. I would agree uh, with you, uh, Tim, on a timeline basis. I think we are there already from uh, you know, affordability for enterprises, right? I think uh, whether you use an open source, open core platform, or whether you use a well-supported enterprise platform, like for example, Corda has both. So we have a Corda open source for, you know, a smaller use cases or experimentation and the enterprise version for enterprises who need, you know, call-in support and things like that. Uh, so I think we, what we are seeing is we are there for the uh, large enterprises. I would say, you know, the small enterprises will all of at least, you know, the space we are tackling uh, financial services, trade, insurance kind of areas. I think the small enterprises will be consumers of technology, right? Um, many times as if they will buy off the shelf applications built on Corda or any other platform for that matter. Uh, they, you know, in occasions you will see an SME build an in-house solution, but that, that would not be the more common case. Uh, but, you know, even, even with uh, uh, Tim and his team, uh, Mr. Ifan, we are building a border network in China as well, right? So I think that that's to make it far more easier uh, to, you know, deploy and build solutions for large scale SME networks. So I think in some sense, we'll, we'll start seeing the first steps uh, for the mass adoption for SMEs. But I think I agree with Tim, it will take a little bit of time. Uh, the yeah. journey we started with the large guys uh, five years ago is starting to fruition and gain steam. And I think we have to go on the same journey a little bit with uh, the SME industry. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, you make a, you make a good point. I mean, we saw Starbucks, Walmart, uh, Nestle, Facebook, um, you know, you name it. They, they all started, it, it's all started with the, the big guys. Um, but Charles, I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, are the big guys, you know, are they all engaging or, you know, increasingly are these conversations also with the SMEs, small, medium enterprises? I think blockchain will come to SMEs without them realizing. So if you look at what's happening, and this is what is fascinating and exciting about this space, right, is you might have an SME as an SME, some projects to build on blockchain, but at the same time, uh, your, your banks and your central bank is also working on blockchain. So maybe SMEs will start to interact with uh, decentralized finance, CBDCs, uh, and consume these services uh, without, without having a plan yet. Maybe their banks will come to them and say, okay, if you start to process your payments uh, with CBDCs, we're going to reduce the cost, we're going to accelerate the transactions. So I think it's uh, uh, the SMEs and the users are step-by-step step surrounded by the, by the technology, and it's going to come into their life and their operation in a very smooth way. So if you look at the, the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, which consensus is really uh, focusing on, You've got today more than uh, 400,000 developers everywhere in the world. Uh, it means developers in, uh, in nations where, uh, where this kind of skills uh, comes, uh, comes in, uh, in plenty as well as, as very affordable. And there is project also where we, we help the banks, we help central banks to reinvent the finance of, uh, uh, of, of tomorrow. And this uh, modern finance uh, and these smart money such as CBDCs will, uh, will enter into the world of SMEs and probably start to put the foundation. So that's one point. The other point where I really uh, join the comments from Tim and, and Amit is um, around the technology. I think when we all started five years ago, it was still uh, very much big accounts. Uh, uh, to building the platform was something which was really a uh, hands on uh, process uh, involving smart contract developers and everything. But the technology is also maturing. Uh, really quickly. Uh, so it, what it means when, it, when the technology matures, it becomes much more affordable and easy to start to interact with it. Uh, you can start to consume blockchain as a service today. Uh, you can start to consume uh, blockchain from your mobile phone uh, very easily. Uh, and all this ecosystem plays in the technology. Uh, the ecosystem is growing. Uh, the money, which, has, which is really at the heart of SME's activities and, and everyone's activities, is also changing and going into blockchain. Um, and the technology can be consumed in a much more casual way. Uh, so it's easier to build also. So I don't think we are five years uh, ahead, uh, away from, from mass adoption. I think it's going to come way faster than we think, but not necessarily with, uh, uh, with the enterprise uh, use case we think, but uh, uh, enterprises will start to use uh, blockchain assets, blockchain-based assets uh, in the very near future. I would say 18 to, to, to 24 months. And, and I, to, I think that timeline is, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Sorry, I was, I was gonna, sorry, Angie. Um, I was gonna, you know, Charles makes a great point. I, I think um, when we look at the example that I gave of corporate finance for SMEs upstream for large enterprises, those SMEs are engaging, you know, there are tens of thousands of them that are engaging with blockchain today, but they probably don't know it. Um, they probably just know that they're able to get financing and get their credit approved in one day versus a month. And I think that's, that's the way a lot of SMEs are going to get introduced to it, not as, oh, this is blockchain technology, so I, I want to do it. They're just going to be a part of a network or be a part of some multi-party workflow where things just move faster and more efficient. And they say, well, I, I, I want to do more of that. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, the most people probably don't know in the same way that, you know, in a retail experience, you, you have no idea. You just, it, it, things are just getting done. I'd like to echo that. Uh, sorry, sorry to step in, Angie, but uh, I, yeah. I'd like to echo that a little bit. And, you know, we see a lot of uh, the same phenomena, maybe, you know, at a smaller scale, given, you know, nobody's as big as China from an impact perspective, <laughs> but uh, you yeah. know, we, we do see similar stuff happening in places like Singapore, Thailand, even Hong Kong, right? Uh, so in Singapore, for example, you know, one of the companies we work with right now is building a solution for multilateral netting for money transfer operators. Now, money transfer operators are typically SMEs, right? Mm. And this is a confidential computing solution to make sure data exchange happens securely. And, you know, the government is really supporting this uh, 
company through their uh, through their financial grants and through the exposure it allows. So I think governments, uh, both through the efforts uh, and the technology they build and consume themselves, or through financial support or other support, can really drive change. And it's quite evident in China, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, Thailand. I think many of these governments have really put, I think, digitization as a key pillar. And as part of that key pillar, blockchain is one of the, you know, I would say three to five top priorities for them. Like uh, you see AI, ML, and cybersecurity as other pillars in most countries, but blockchain is uh, right front and center. Uh, but again, it's not about blockchain really, it's about the value these technologies can provide and the problems you can solve. Mm -hmm. Sorry, back to you. No, absolutely, that, that's, that's being on, Tim. Uh, I, I, to... I agree. No, I, I was I was going to say I, I, we we see the same thing in China, um, and I think one of the, the it, by making it a national initiative, it's created a lot of activity at the government level, at the enterprise level. Um, I think in in we've seen that in other uh, markets in Asia, as as I'm referred to. I think it's been it's been a bit more organic. Um, mm. in the Americas, in Europe, um, for lack of, of kind of a tops down push. Um, so I see the same thing. And, and, you know, so, so it, it just, there's, there's such a environment of support um, currently in this part of the world in Asia. Um, what are the, let's start with, with the good news. What are the successes that you've seen so far? What best practices, successes, and and why? So um, I'd, I'd love to I'd love to hear some of the highlights um, that that we're seeing uh, blockchain uh, being put to good use. Jet, I'll I'll start with you. I you oh. you've just got such a a broad kind of um, you know. Uh, with Ant Group and SMEs, what are some of the success stories that you can share? I think the um, at the moment we we see the some of the scenario which is uh, very interesting. For example, the leasing solution. Uh, formerly, when we uh, some enterprise providing the leasing solution, uh, they normally they have this is very heavy, right? They have to bought everything in advance and uh, providing the leasing solution, so they have a very Huge pressure on the their finance, right? So now we using the we are using the leasing uh, blockchain to support this the leasing solution. So once you have a purchase order coming from your client, and then you directly using this uh, this uh, purchase order to, to go to the banks to get the uh, financial services, and also financial um, the banks could realize that all right, actually you are buying some um, hardware coming from let's say Intel or whatever. So you don't necessarily pay on that anymore. So Intel will pay that because you are providing the leasing solution for your enterprise. So end of the day, um, this is not really heavy anymore. So the leasing solution just focus on how to make the customer happy, right? Focus on the client service, not focus on the financial services. So blockchain can connect the dots and be able to provide the trust on this end-to-end uh, -end value chain. So this is now very successful and we see the so many startups coming to working with us on this, this part. Uh, major coming on uh, computer, cell phone, whatever, this is the leasing solution. This is very early stage. But end of the day, you, if you go to some very um, other industries, let's say leasing for, for the battery, right? Leasing for the uh, buildings or whatever, then this is more interesting, right? So. Um, this is something that, that we see. So based on the scenario, really based on the scenario and based on how the, uh, including government in, uh, and also the startups, how they, uh, um, you know, realize the value of the blockchain. So um, we are also do a lot of, uh, you know, this education on the market to see, hey, who is our partner and ecosystem to work on this uh, industry solution together with us. Yeah. This is one of the scenario. Yeah. Charles, uh, there's probably so many to pick from, but what, what do you think is the most impactful success story thus far? In the world of enterprise, what we see is a lot of use cases around financial services. Uh, why finance? Because finance is a, a 
uh, a very large industry. Uh, it's a very competitive industry uh, where there is a lot of problems to fix and also some budget to fix these problems. So I think that's where we all started with a, a lot of use cases over there. So you think of, uh, of, uh, of finance, but you get also now the support of central banks starting to move money uh, we, on, the, on the blockchain or through, through CBDCs. So at Consensus, we help the HKMA, we help uh, uh, Bank of Thailand, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia, Banque de France in, in bringing money to, uh, to, to, to blockchain in, in the form of CBDCs. And from there, there is a lot of uh, kind of stimulations from all these uh, this, uh, use cases in the, in the world of enterprises. Huge uh, use cases, which is growing very quickly also, is all the business around uh, carbon credits and carbon uh, credit mm. exchange, uh, which is also something which aligns with a lot of government initiatives, should it be uh, here in, in Asia, but, but also in, uh, in the Western world. So carbon exchange, carbon credit exchange is a, is a massive use case where you see different parts of the world, which will be either uh, positive in credit or negative in credit, and carbon credit. And then there is obviously a, a trade to be done there. So a lot of activities around finance always. But what we see also emerging is uh, some kind of more mass market use cases, which, which Ethereum host uh, very, uh, very nicely, such as NFTs. So you think of NFTs for art, but there is also NFTs for all the digital world as uh, a new generation is, uh, is, uh, is leading in, uh, having, uh, having NFTs for uh, your video games or virtual assets in, uh, in, uh, in video games. And this is, we are talking mass, uh, mass adoption here. And you see a lot of um, uh, video gaming studio um, music producers uh, starting to use NFTs to reinvent uh, actually their, their business models. And what's interesting is they, are, they start to approach using the reach of, of the Ethereum uh, network. They start to approach new, um, new communities and new users. And that's where we're, we're the, beyond the technology uh, challenge uh, and value proposition they bring. They bring also a, a new and fresh, fresh audience, which I think is, uh, is fascinating for, for the space in general. And one space also, which probably will, will get more and more traction, even CBDCs are coming our way at the refi space, is as well as the, the world of decentralized finance, DeFi, which again, Ethereum is, is hosting uh, most of the activity today. And you look at how you can start to work with programmable uh, finance, how you can start to have composable finance as well, and how all these processes in the world of finance uh, get essentially uh, automated through some business logics. Uh, so you can start to build a much more, much more efficient um, uh, financial processes or, or capital efficiency overall. So starting from finance, but starting to reach um, via uh, via the technology itself and all the tools yeah. available, new communities. A lot of a, a lot of impact there. Um, you know, so so many success stories. What do you think the challenges are? You know, I'm, I'm hearing from this group that obviously there's been great impact, but there's still a long road ahead. Um, you know, as, as you've said, uh, the, there's, the, we're not quite there yet. Um, Tim, from your view, what are the challenges? I, I think um, there are several. Um, cost is a big one and cost, mm -hmm. there are various dimensions to cost. There's cost of set, you know, building and maintaining a, an environment and operating it. There's cost of developers because blockchain developers tend to be pretty scarce right now relative to you know, kind of standard web developers. So I think there are multiple dimensions of, of cost. And then the other one is interoperability. Um, I, I really don't think we're going to realize this world that we imagine of, of millions of chains. Um, because until we can create it much easier for chains to interoperate with each other. Um, and, and those are really two of the big goals of, of the BSN is, is driving down the cost um, by creating a shared uh, resource environment on a multi you know, public cloud um, and making interoperability easier so that with the tools that we have in the BSN, the cross chain services, you can, you know, connect two chains with two or three lines of code in, you know, five to 10 minutes. Um, with the BSN, you can also train a developer who has no blockchain experience to develop a blockchain application in less than three days. Um, so we think it's, it's initiatives like that, some of which we're trying to drive through the BSN um, that really solve some of those issues. And, and, you know, one of the SMEs that we haven't talked about really yet is, um, the startup ecosystem. 
Um, and, and I think that's one of the most exciting things that I think about the space right now and about what we're doing to BSN is bringing the power of blockchain to, like I mentioned, you know, a university student in her dorm room, you know, a high school kid, uh, you know, someone who has a, an idea, uh, maybe a crazy idea um, that they want to they want to build a, a network on. But with BSN, they can do it for you know, $100 or $200 US, whereas before they had to do it for, you know, for multiple thousands of dollars. So it's, it's only when we get to those cost levels that I think we're really gonna see that, the type of innovation that we all imagine. Yeah. Maybe I can <laughs> jump in uh, very quickly. I think one of the challenge we have uh, in some industries is that some industries are already uh, very mature. Uh, there is a very small number of players uh, in those industries. Therefore, the innovation and the, the space for reinventing themselves is way more limited. So if we look at some industries where there is a lot of competition, you will always find a challenger which will, uh, which will kind of reinvent itself and brings additional value to the table to, to get, uh, to get uh, an advantage on the market. But we, are all, we, we also have around us uh, some industries where uh, they are almost uh, uh, oligopolies. Uh, and there is only a few players uh, in these spaces, uh, you will not see the technology move, uh, innovation moving so fast and blockchain is also a good use case, but there is no appetite from, from this kind of community. And that's one of the challenges we, we might see um, spreading, spreading the technology or the use. Uh, some people have just not yet uh, been challenged enough or captured the value proposition to, to start to move on. I think moving from like, like status quo to any change, uh, whether it be blockchain led or anything else is, you know, uh, is always the first biggest challenge, I would say. So I would agree with everybody there. I would echo the challenge for tech talent as well, which Tim pointed out. Uh, you know, we build code on Java uh, language, which is very easy to use, but even then, you know, uh, there are 20 million Java developers in the world, but still it seems that they're scarce. <laughs> so, you know, it is just tech talent is hard. And I think historically, if you think about uh, where blockchain industry started, it was about consortia. It was about industry getting together and multi-party workflows. And really, I think that was a very big mindset shift, right? Uh, like we have for hundred years, probably built technology for our own house. Uh, we have we have not built technology with our competitor or our peer in the industry, right? And and what what is happening is uh, you know with the progress of the technology now this this concept is becoming more familiar. But I think the ability to jump on the technology and use it uh, is also becoming far easier, right? Uh, so you know you don't have to think many times that should I work with my peer group in the industry? Like you know you naturally see the benefits. And finally, I would also say, I think one of you uh, touched upon the a point about the startup ecosystem and the venture ecosystem. Really, uh, and NGV, we, we, uh, we announced the news yesterday with, uh, with your uh, uh, franchise on you know, the work we are doing with uh, MAS backed Afin in Singapore to drive okay. CBDC innovation, right? Uh, and that's with really to- Private enterprise, yeah. Yeah, and that's really to you know, bring many more players in the space right this is like not all everything can be done by any one of us uh, alone right uh, so you know how do you drive innovation either through efforts like bsn and what we are doing there making it cheaper or working with the regulator and their uh, marketplaces here in singapore for example and driving innovation on cbdc's right so so really i think a lot more to be done but i think a lot has been done and a, it has become a lot easier in the last six years, I would say, but uh, <laughs> you know, the next 10 years or next two years or next six months, all is very, very exciting. Yeah. It, it, that's absolutely true. Uh, Jet, yeah. what's, what's your view? Yeah. I think uh, I have a very similar view of uh, the, the, with the gentlemen's. Uh, of course, the cost, I, I think that's the most important. Um, this is still quite expensive more for most of, most of the enterprises, especially they have not aware of the value. This is the critical stuff. And second thing, I think the, the ecosystem, let's say the startups, right? There's not so many startups. And also the developers, the experience the developers. Um, we did some um, investigation in China market. Actually, um, if someone have a blockchain experience for more than three years, there's only less than 3,000 people in China. 
So definitely there's a lacking of the, you know, experience of the developers is, is one of the showstoppers. Once, you know, especially that there's so many startups, they have a very, very high salary attraction for this experience of the developers. So normally SME or whatever, they can hardly afford on that. And, and third thing, I think the, the, the scenarios, right? Which area that we getting start first, especially that people don't really care about the blockchain itself. They care about the value coming from that. So this is not so mature at the moment. And finally, I think the, we see the, the issue is that, let's say supply chain finance. So blockchain is just a record uh, online, but before that, right, um, the blockchain, um, before the, all, uh, the, the coverage of uh, blockchain, let's say we, are, we have the fake information on the, on, the, on the supply chain information, then this is purely the garbage in, garbage out, right? So you have to adopt the supply chain um, SaaS or whatever AI or IoT to make sure this uh, data is correct. So this, uh, this, uh, this the combination of the technology can make this uh, challenge even worse, right? So I think there's the early, um, still long way to go to make sure that blockchain is a part of these uh, technologies. Yeah, and we're also starting to see um, almost a bifurcation of, of protocols. One is permission mm -hmm. chains, and then one obviously is public chains, right? And so, um, they seem to be taking on kind of two different characteristics. Public chains really uh, for retail, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Permission chains seem to be um, something that enterprises prefer. W why did this divergence occur, number one? Number two, do you see them coming back together potentially? So more or less, we are focused on the enterprise, especially even we're using the private cloud to, um, to run this uh, the blockchain. So only the government and its ecosystem is using that. So we see this trend that the enterprise blockchain can help, first of all, help them because the, by the nature of the blockchain, the security issue is not always a, a, is a problem. And also the performance could be a showstopper of this, uh, of this uh, solution. So this enterprise chain for, let's say the public sector or from a certain industry, is uh, I think the the major requirement coming from our clients. So, um, but for the for other area, for us is at the moment it's not our short term focus from the from the enterprise requirements. Yeah, yeah, uh, very interesting. I, uh, I I think uh, you know the three reasons in my mind why the diversions happened. And uh, in fact, we started when we started our company. We didn't have Corda. Uh, we had to build Corda. Uh, really to address some of those challenges. So it was cost, uh, scalability, which is performance and privacy, right? Uh, I think those are the three reasons why we had to build a permission chain ourselves uh, uh, and not use some of the public chains available at that time uh, and, and the state they were at that time. Uh, of course, things have changed. My view, Angie, is I think uh, we will see uh, more interoperability in the future. I think uh, we will we will see asset classes flowing between chains. Uh, I think you know uh, we will see benefits of permission coming into the you know the DeFi space potentially uh, at some point. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good stuff happening there, but there's a lot of unregulated stuff happening there, right? Uh, and if regulated markets have to participate in unregulated uh, excitement. I think you need uh, some some bridges, right? So I would say you know. Uh, the industry as a whole is progressing in the right direction. I would, I would say, you know, there will be some use cases where only permission will be uh, valid and use cases where only public will be valid, public chains. But you will see many where, you know, there's some degree of collaboration, overlap or bridging in the near future. I, I think I agree. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think another issue is just economics, right? Um, in a public chain, gas fees are typically paid by cryptocurrencies. And so, you know, it's hard to imagine a scenario where a large enterprise would want to, you know, adopt a public chain in a large way when they make revenue in fiat and they're paying, you know, gas fees on the network in cryptocurrencies because, and large enterprises need stability. Um, <laughs> So one, one of the things we're actually doing in that space is that we have an initiative called Open Permission Blockchain, where we're 
converting uh, public chains to be able to operate um, in a regulatory uh, wise way in China by stripping out the cryptocurrencies and making the nodes permission. Um, so I think there, I think there are going to be all kinds of, you know, experiments like that. Um, but I do think there is a there are some fundamental barriers to a large enterprises adopting uh, public chains in a big way. Does that change the characteristic of of the, those protocols though, from public chain to being a you know working with with some structure on a permission chain? <clears throat> well, I mean, obviously, it changes the cryptocurrency aspect and the the, yeah. the public node aspect of it, um, but. There are other characteristics of the chain that would go unchanged, um, and we, you know we've got a lot of public chains who are, you know, close to a dozen who are who are doing that right now. Maybe, Angie, maybe just to complement everyone's comments is, I think at the end of the day we are inventing the third generations of the internet. Uh, so probably uh, what we see is uh, blockchain technology following similar patterns. So the internet started in the nineties with essentially an intranet out of some universities. And there was then uh, another intranet and another intranet and eventually all these intranets starting to merge. Um, I think the, the, the generations of blockchain which are permission uh, will essentially fade out because they uh, commercially are very complicated to make fly uh, because you build a private network like a private club, you need to be a member of this network, you need to have a special connectivity with this network. And eventually you predefine uh, the reach and the scale of your business, depending on the number of this uh, number of members on your network. And if you look at what the internet is today, the value proposition, it gives you a global reach. Uh, so our view is that uh, there is evolutions of the technology over time, but everyone will eventually meet uh, on global uh, blockchain network. Some of them might be hybrid, some of them will be uh, will be global because they offer you the reach. But it makes no sense uh, to rebuild the internet. We know where uh, we know where the internet are today. Uh, they are basically nowhere. There is no more internet. There is privacy on global networks because we need to have the reach. And coming into uh, uh, architectures or technologies which are basically wall garden where you can be invited or not, uh, have have some benefits. Uh, but over time, they will uh, they will essentially fade and 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 just become the third generation of internet after the first generation, which was really consuming information, second generation, the, our social life moving to the web two and the web three being the, the peer-to-peer interaction and the internet of value. So I think we, we have to be all patient, but uh, in, uh, in my view, the history is already written. So Charles is asking, uh, asking, begging me for to disagree here a little bit. Uh, so <laughs> I will, <laughs> naturally, as you can imagine. Uh, so look, I, I, I don't disagree that there is more common standards needed. So I, I, I would agree that, right? And I think we are in alignment there. I think if you look at internet, there is, of course, the protocol layer today with TCP IP, but then there is various business networks or business platforms, whether it be the Google, Amazon, Facebooks of the world, or even in specific industries which exist on top of that internet, which is very private and permissioned in many ways, right? Uh, so I, I, I would strongly disagree that, you know, the permission world will fade away. I think the industry definitely needs uh, that common standard, right? And I, I think that is definitely where, you know, companies and platforms will come together. I also feel that, you know, we have way too many public blockchains uh, today, and many of them were actually created to just monetize the benefits from a cryptocurrency perspective, as we know, and hence we see the volatility in the industry. But uh, I would say they, they'll coexist uh, rather than one versus the other, in my view. This this is a this is when we in our biz we say you are speaking your book. So uh, of course, you know, obviously from permissioned, and then Charles is public. So it's very clear. It doesn't surprise anybody of uh, these points of view. But you know, I I I I think there is a world in which um, you know we are in a moment where we are oscillating between the two. Um, there are obvious functions, uh, but you know, Tim, what you're building over at BSN uh, is to actually allow all of these um, platforms and protocols to, you know, talk to each other. And so, then, what does a world like that look like? 
I mean, I, I think, um, you know, you're right. We're, we're building a, an infrastructure that, um, that creates uh, opportunities for multiple different permissioned and permission protocols. And, and we work with all three of the other companies uh, who we have here with, with trials on, on consensus and, and uh, Corda with Amit and R3. And then more recently, um, we've integrated uh, AntChain into our uh, BSN in the Hainan provincial government. Um, which, uh, which Jet mentioned a little earlier, some of the government services. So, so yeah, we're, we're creating a, a platform that um, enables innovation, um, addresses the big challenges that we talked about in cost and interoperability. Um, and so what, what we see is a world of, of millions of chains um, uh, you know, throughout different types of businesses, different types of governments with those chains being able to very quickly and easily uh, interact and exchange information. And, you know, certainly a world with uh, a lot more developers able to easily and quickly develop uh, on blockchain. You know, my little guy is four years old, but man, I think, you know, when we think about jobs of the future as being uh, undefined for most, uh, for, for most of this generation, I think one definitive job is definitely a developer. Um, that is definitely part of uh, our collective future. Um, we don't we'll get, have- we can, uh, We'll get him on the BSN. We'll teach him how to <laughs> program. We have just a few minutes left, but I think for our audience, you know, what does that future look like? I think from all of your points of view, would love to hear, you know, um, what does what does the future look like? And if you're an SME um, that are, is not engaging in blockchain uh, enterprise, what does your future look like uh, as you watch your competitors who are um, in the next five years? My, my sense is I think competitiveness will come from engaging in uh, emerging technologies or technologies like blockchain, but you know, could be others as well. Like I think, you know, the benefits which uh, SME gets from leveraging a blockchain based solution is, you know, better data quality, you know, better prices for the services they can offer. Uh, and in many cases, they can get access to financing as we discussed earlier in the conversation, right? So I think that will enable companies and SMEs who adopt these solutions to be more competitive vis-a-vis -vis their peers. So, you know, if, if you're an SME, you don't necessarily need to build something, you, you, but you need to find the best solution out there because there are quite a few right now uh, across the world in many countries. So just be educated enough to question uh, you know, what is the underlying technology, what benefits it brings and how it scales for them as they scale their business. Uh, so that's, that's my view for SMEs. Charles, put on your, put on your forecast hat. I guess the same way SMEs has been disrupted by email and now uh, maybe uh, messaging such as WeChat and payments such as end, uh, uh, end solutions. Uh, blockchain will come also with the, within the within their daily life in in different ways to just accelerate things which are taking a lot of their time today as mentioned by uh, by Amin. Yeah. And I guess uh, to embrace this future, uh, I really want to invite every SME owners or, or executives to start the learning curve, uh, starting to document themselves about the different blockchains, uh, starting to kind of stimulate or launch ideas of uh, of experimentation within the company. Uh, it's just about starting the learning curve. Uh, either you start today and you will be ready uh, or more ready uh, when things get uh, get more concrete for your, your business. Uh, but just uh, engaging with uh, with events, uh, reading about the, uh, the technology and the ecosystem on Forecast News, for example, uh, opening free accounts uh, on, on different uh, blockchain-based services and, and joining some initiative. I think it's, uh, it's just about learning. Uh, so that when something yeah. conflict comes, uh, you're ready to strike. I, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, <laughs> dispute that at all. It, it, I mean, one of the reasons why we founded Forecast was exactly that: the future is coming, and uh, either it bigfoots you, uh, and or you are engaged, you understand, uh, and when the tide comes, you're surfing. Um, 
the the future is clear to us. We're, we're reporting on it uh, all the time. Tim, in your view, uh, what is the future in the next five, 10 years? I, uh, it's a tough question, but um, I mean, I, I think, um, like I said, I think that um, blockchain is really in its infancy right now. Um, and I think, you know, one of the goals of the BSN is to create a, an environment and an infrastructure where people can experiment and innovate. And, you know, I, I, I again, going back to the internet in the mid nineties, I remember, you know, I was in Silicon Valley at the time and, you know, you just pick three companies, pets.com, uh, which sold pet food online, cosmo.com, which did same day delivery and amazon.com, which sold books. Um, and, you know, if you were to go back in time, it'd be hard to pick a winner at that time. Now, th those two are gone and Amazon, the third one does all of what they do and, and more. So I, I think we want to, we want to create an environment like that, where people can experiment, where companies can start up with an idea and, and succeed or fail and innovate, pivot. Um, and so that's what we're trying to create for the next five to 10 years. And that, that architecture um, of the future, I guess. And I wanted to leave the last uh, the last word to Jet. Um, you know, from your vantage point, um, what China is building and accelerating in this space is is really interesting to watch uh, from a journalist's point of view. Um, where, you know, from your vantage point, what what does the next five years look like in China? because what's happening now in China is probably what's gonna to happen to the rest of the world in the next five years. So I'm curious to know in China, next five years, because it's, it's, that really is the future. But surely if we were working with SMEs, let's say uh, supply chain finance, if the big names doesn't really jump in or fully engage on this blockchain, then the supply chain finance could hardly work, right? We see a lot of uh, big names were focused on the supply chain finance, something like that. So this will help SME get a better service on that. So we see this uh, two trend that will make sure that uh, the mass adoption for the SMEs would be much earlier. As well, I think the for following area, for example, uh, financial services, let's say we talk about the leasing solution, actually the financial services for leasing solution, right? And also the the uh, the uh, the supply chain finance, of course. And recently, last year, we issued called a uh, trade finance. We call this a uh, trust board, so that over overseas trade can be powered by blockchain. So we, they get also financial service as well, right? So do this uh, financial related service is definitely one of the key scenario for the, uh, the for the SMEs because end of the day they need to earn the money, they need to survive, right? And also sometimes even the governments they want to issue some tax free or some coupons, whatever for this SME. But without blockchain, they could hardly uh, be very accurate to you know, help these SMEs, right? So this is of course the very important scenario. We see that once the government and also the big name are in the game then the, the mass adoption for the SME could be much faster than before. Seamless, frictionless, immutability and trust. That is the promise of blockchain. And uh, well, you have all fulfilled your promise to the audience today uh, and educated all of us on uh, the future of blockchain. So happy SME day, happy world SME day. Um, Tim Bailey, Charles Dosi, Jet Ziang, Amit Ghosh, always a pleasure to speak with all of you. And uh, on behalf of our panelists, I'm Angie Lau. Uh, of Forecast News, Editor-in-Chief, and I thank you, our audience, for joining us as well. And uh, we'll see you again soon.